above paragraphs are only a summation of what has been earlier said, but it is necessary that there should be real clarity of thought on these matters. It is apparent as we study, how this entire sequential process of realization pivots around form manifestation, and has relation to the quality and purpose of the divine mind. This will inevitably be clear to the man who has studied the theme of a treatise on cosmic fire, which deals specifically with the creative process and with manifestation. It deals therefore with the outer personality expression of that great all-encompassing life, which we call God, for lack of a better term. We need to bear in mind that our universe, as far as the highest human consciousness can as yet conceive of it is to be found on the seven subplanes of the cosmic physical plane, and that our highest type of energy, embodying first the purest expression of spirit, is but the source manifestation of the first subplane of the cosmic physical plane. We are dealing, therefore, as far as consciousness is concerned, with what might be regarded symbolically as the brain reaction and response to cosmic purpose, the brain reaction of God himself. In man, the microcosm, the objective of the evolutionary purpose for the fourth kingdom in nature is to enable man to manifest as a soul in time and space and to tune in on the soul purpose and the plan of the creator, as it is known and expressed by the seven spirits before the throne, the seven planetary logoi. But at this point we can only hint at a great mystery, which is that all that the highest of the sons of God on our manifested planetary world can grasp as a partial realization of the purpose and plan of the solar logos, as it is grasped, apprehended and expressed by one of the planetary logoi who is in his place and term of office conditioned and copyright copyright 1998 loses trust. 3. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2. Limited by his own peculiar point in evolution. A seventh part of the unfolding plan is being expressed by our particular planetary life. And because this great being is not one of the seven sacred lives and is therefore not expressing himself through one of the seven sacred planets, the plan is unfolded upon the earth as a part of a dual expression of purpose, and only as another non-sacred planet reaches its consummation can the whole plan for the earth be realized. This may not be easily understood, for, it has been said, only those who are initiate can grasp some of the significance of the statement that, the plane shall be one and together shall express divinity. All that concerns humanity at this time is the necessity for a revelation and a gradual apprehension of the plan which will enable man to a. learn consciously and intelligently b. realize the relation of form and quality to life c. produce that inner transmutation which will bring into manifestation the fifth kingdom in nature, the kingdom of souls all this has to be accomplished in the realm of conscious awareness or response, through the medium of steadily improving vehicles or response mechanisms, and with the aid of spiritual understanding and interpretation. With the bigger questions we will not deal. With the consciousness of the life of God as it expresses itself in the three subhuman kingdoms, we need not concern ourselves. We shall deal entirely with the following three points. 1. With the strictly human consciousness as it begins with the process of individualization and consummates in the dominant personality. 2. With the egoic consciousness, which is that of the solar angel 
is it begins with the preparation for initiation on the path of discipleship and consummates in the perfected master. 3. With the monodic realization. This is a phrase that means absolutely nothing to us, for it concerns the consciousness of the planetary logos. This begins to be realized at the third initiation, dominating the soul and working out through the personality. Man, the average human being, is a sum total of separated tendencies, of uncontrolled forces and of disunited energies, which slowly and gradually become coordinated, fused, and blended in the separated personality. Man, a solar angel, is the sum total of those energies and forces which are unified, blended and controlled by that tendency to harmony, which is the effect of love and the outstanding quality of divinity. Copyright, copyright 1998 loses trust. 4. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2. Man, the living monad, is the veiled reality, and that which the angel of the presence hides. He is the synthetic expression of the purpose of God, symbolized through revealed, divine quality and manifested through the form. Appearance, quality, life, again this ancient propicity confronts us. Symbolically speaking, this triplicity can be studied as 1. Man, the angel, the present. 2. The root, the lotus, the fragrance. 3. The bush, not the fire, the flame. The work of evolution, being part of the determination of deity to express divinity through form, is necessarily, therefore the task of revelation, and as far as man is concerned, this revelation works out as the growth of soul evolution and falls into three stages. 1. Individualization, personality. 2. Initiation, ego. 3. Identification, monad. 1. The three stages of resort growth. We must hold the following statements firmly in our mind. The personality is a triple combination of forces, impressing and absolutely controlling the fourth aspect of the personality which is the dense physical body. The three personality types of energy are the etheric body, which is the vehicle of vital energy, the astral body which is the vehicle of the feeling energy or tension force, and the mental body which is the vehicle of the intelligent energy of will that is destined to be the dominant creative aspect. It is Esotericists. Hence likewise the work of the psychologists as they seek to interpret man and hence also their differentiations as to the human apparatus, so that man is seen, as it were, dissected into his component parts. The recognition is emerging that it is man's quality which outwardly determines his place on the ladder of evolution, 
The modern psychology of the extreme materialistic school erroneously supposes that man's quality is determined by his mechanism, whereas the reverse condition is the determining factor. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 5. The Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2 Disciples have the problem of expressing the duality of love and will through the personality. This statement is a clear enunciation of the goal for the disciple. The initiate has the objective of expressing the will of God through developed love and a wise use of the intelligence. The above preamble lays the ground for the definition of the three stages of egoic growth. What, therefore, is individualization from the standpoint of the psychological unfoldment of man? It is the focusing of the lowest aspect of the soul, which is that of the creative intelligence, so that it can express itself through the form nature. It will eventually be the first aspect of the unity that to express itself. Trust. 6. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, 
Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2. The underlying reason, and the consequent line following of readers, will only come to an end through the intelligent fostering of individual recognition of selfhood and the assertions of the individual as he seeks to express his own ideas. One of the basic ideas underlying all human and individual conduct, is the necessity for peace and harmony in order that man may specifically work out his destiny. This is the deep foundational belief of humanity. The first developed evidence of the emerging self-assertion of the massed individuals must therefore be turned in this direction, for it will constitute the line of least resistance. There will follow then the eradication of war and the establishing of those conditions of peace which will bring about the opportunity for trained and carefully cultured growth. The dictator is the individual who has, under the process, flowered forth into knowledge and power, and is an example of the effectiveness of the divine character, when permitted scope and as the product of the evolutionary process. He expresses many of the divine potentialities of man. But the dictator will someday be an anachronism, for when the many are at the stage of individual self-awareness and potency and seeking the full expression of their powers, he will be lost from sight in the assertion of the many. He, today, indicates the goal for the lower self, for the personality. Before, however, the many men can be safely self-asserted, there must be an increased appearance of those who have passed beyond that stage, and of those who know, teach and demonstrate, so that the many constituting the intelligent group, composed of the self-aware individuals, can then identify themselves discriminatingly with group purpose, and submerge their separative identities in organized group activity and synthesis. This is the predominant task of the new group of world servers. It should be the aspiration of the world disciples today. This work of training the individuals in group purpose must be accomplished in three ways. 1. By personal, imposed identification with the group, through the experience of understanding, service and sacrifice. This can look well constitute a useful self-imposed experiment. By the education of the masses in the principles underlying group work, and the training of an enlightened public opinion in these concepts. 3. By the preparation of many in the new group of world servers for that great transition in consciousness which we call initiation. Initiation. What, therefore, is initiation? Initiation might be defined in two ways. It is first of all the entering into a new and wider dimensional world by the expansion of a man's consciousness so that he can include and encompass that which he now
initiatory process before they are practiced experimentally in the daily life and thus psychologically integrated into the practical expression of the living process on the physical plane. Herein lies much danger and difficulty, and also much loss of time. The mental grasp of the individual is oftentimes much greater than his power to express the knowledge, and we have consequently those outstanding failures and those difficult situations. situations which have brought the whole question of initiation into this repute. Many people are regarded as initiates who are only endeavoring to be initiates. They are not, however, real initiates. They are those well-meaning people whose mental understanding outruns the power of their personalities to practice. They are those those who are in touch with forces which they are not yet able to handle and control. They have done a great deal of the needed work of inner contact, but have not yet put the lower nature into shape. They are, therefore, unable to express that which they inwardly understand and somewhat realize. They are those disciples who talk too much and too soon and too self-centeredly, and who present to the world an ideal toward which they are indeed working, but which they are as yet unable to materialize, owing to the inadequacy of their equipment. They affirm their belief in terms of accomplished fact and cause much stumbling among the little ones. But at the same time, they are working towards the goal. They are mentally in touch with the ideal and with the plan. They are aware of forces and energies utterly unknown to the majority. Their only mistake is in the realm of time, for they affirm prematurely that which someday they will be. When initiation becomes possible, it indicates that two great groups of energies, those of the triple integrated personality and those of the soul as solar angel, are beginning to fuse and blend. The energy of the soul is beginning to dominate and to control the lower types of force, and, according to the ray of the soul, so will be the body in which that control will begin to make its presence felt. This will be elaborated later in the section dealing with the rays as they govern the various bodies, mental, emotional and physical. Physical. It should be remembered that very little egoic control needs need the evidence when the first initiation is taken. Taken. That initiation indicates simply that the germ of soul life has the talist and brought into functioning existence the inner spiritual body, the sheep of the inner spiritual man, which will eventually enable the man of the third initiation to manifest forth as a full-grown man in Christ, and present at that time the opportunity to the monad for that full expression of life which can take place when the initiate is identified consciously with the one life. Between the first and second initiations, as has been frequently stated, much time can elapse and much change must be wrought during the many stages of discipleship. Upon this we will later dwell as we study the seven laws of egoic unfoldment. Individualization, carried to its full, consummates as the integrated personality, expressing itself as a unity through three aspects. This expression of personality involves 1. The free use of the mind so that focused attention can be paid to all that concerns the personal. Copyright Copyright 1998 Loses Trust 8. 
A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2. Self and its aims. This spells personality, success and prosperity. 2. The power to control the emotions and yet have the full use of the sensory apparatus to sense conditions, to feel reactions, and to bring about contact with the emotional aspects of other personalities. 3. The capacity to touch the plane of ideas and to bring them through into consciousness. Even if these are later subordinated to selfish purpose and interpretation, the man can, however, be in touch with that which can be spiritually cognized. The free use of the mind presupposes its growing sensitivity to intuitional impression. 4. The demonstration of many talents, powers and the working out of genius, and the emphatic bending of the whole personality to the expression of some one of these powers. There is often an extreme versatility and an ability to do many outstanding things. Things noticeably well. The physical man is frequently a wonderfully sensitive instrument of the inner, emotional and mental selves, and gifted with great magnetic power, there is often resilient, though never robust, bodily health, and great charm and personal outer gifts. A study of the outstanding individuals in all fields of world expression today, when entirely divorced from the higher good concepts and the constant spiritual aspiration to serve humanity, will indicate the nature of the consummated individuality and the success of this part of the divine plan. service. 
service is not the above sufficiently practical. Initiation carried to its consummation, as far as humanity is concerned, produces the liberated master of the wisdom, free from the limitations of the individual, garnering the fruits of the individualization process and functioning increasingly as the solar angel, with his focus primarily in the inner spiritual body. Awareness of the presence is thus steadily developed. This fact merits the deep study and meditation of all disciples. As the three rays which govern the lower triplicity blend and synthesize and produce the vital personality, and as they in their turn dominate the ray of the dense physical body, the lower man enters into a prolonged condition of conflict. Gradually and increasingly, the soul ray, the ray of persistent and magnetic grasp, as it is occultly called, begins to become more active, in the brain of the man who is a developed personality, an increased awareness of vibration is set up. There are many degrees and stages in this experience, and they cover many lives. The personality ray and the egoic ray at first seem to clash, and then later a steady warfare is set up with the disciple as the onlooker, and dramatic participator. Arjuna emerges into the arena of the battlefield. Midway between the two forces he stands, a conscious tiny point of sentient awareness and of light. Around him and in him and through him the energies of the two rays pour and conflict. Gradually, as the battle continues to rage, he becomes a more active factor, and drops the attitude of the detached and uninterested onlooker. When he is definitely aware of the issues involved, and definitely throws the weight of his influence, desires, and mind onto the side of the soul, he can take the first initiation. When the ray of the soul focuses itself fully through him, and all the centers are controlled by that focused soul ray, then he becomes the transfigured initiate, and takes the third initiation. The ray of the personality is occultly, extinguished, or absorbed by the ray of the soul, and all the potencies and attributes of the lower rays become subsidiary to and colored by the soul ray. The disciple becomes a man of God, a person whose powers are controlled by the dominant vibration of the soul ray and whose inner sensitive mechanism is vibrating to the measure of that soul ray which, in its turn, is being itself reoriented to, and controlled by, the monodic ray. The process then repeats itself. 1. The many rays which constitute the lower separative man are fused and blended into the three personality rays. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 10. A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2. 2. These are, in their turn, fused and blended into a synthetic expression of the dominant self-assertive man, the personal self. 3. The personality rays then become one ray and in their turn become subservient to the blue ray of the soul. Again, therefore, three rays are blended and fused. 4. The soul rays dominate the personality and the two become a human one, as the blue ray of the soul and the blended ray of the personality vibrate to the measure of the highest of the soul ray, and the ray of the soul group, which is ever regarded as the soul ray's ray. 5. Then, in time, the soul ray begins, at the third initiation, to blend with the ray of the monad, the light ray. The higher initiate is therefore a dual and not a triple expression. 6. 
In time, however, this realized duality gives place to the mysterious, indescribable process called identification which is the final stage of soul unfoldment. It is useless to say more for what might be said could only be comprehended by those preparing for the fourth initiation, and this treatise is written for disciples and initiates of the first degree. In these successive stages we can glimpse the vision of what we are in maybe. Steadily the unfolding purpose of our own souls goes, angels of persistent and undying love, should gain fuller and deeper control over each of us, and this, at any personal cost and sacrifice, should be our steadfast aim. For this, in truth and sincerity, we should strive. We have thus touched upon the three great divisions which mark the soul's progress towards its goal. Through the process of individualization, the soul arrives at a true self-consciousness and awareness in the three worlds of its experience. The actor in the drama of life masters his part. Through the process of initiation, the soul becomes aware of the essential nature of divinity. Participation in full consciousness with the group and the absorption of the personal and individual into the whole, characterize this stage on the path of evolution. Finally comes the mysterious process wherein the soul becomes so absorbed into that supreme reality and synthesis through identification that even the consciousness of the group fades out except when deliberately recovered in the work of service. Not as then known save deity, no separation of any part, no lesser synthesis, and no divisions or differentiations. During these processes it might be stated that three streams of energy play upon the consciousness of the awakening man. A. The energy of matter itself as it affects the consciousness of the inner spiritual man, who is using the form as a medium of expression. Copyright Copyright 1998 Loses Trust 11. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2. B. The Energy of the Soul Itself or of the solar angel, as that energy pours forth upon the vehicles and produces reciprocal energy in the solar form. C. The energy of life itself, a meaningless phrase, and one that only initiates of the third initiation can grasp, for even the discoveries of modern science give no real idea as to the true nature of life. Life or essential energy is more than the activity of the atom, or of that living principle which produces self-perpetuation, reproduction, motion, growth, and the peculiar something which we call living. It may be possible to create or produce the lowest or third aspect of life in the scientific laboratory so-called but to reproduce or create the other and more essential aspects which work out as the conscious response, the intelligent embryonic purpose which seems to animate all substances, that is not possible. When the third initiation is reached, man will understand why this impossibility exists. More cannot be said, for until that initiation is experienced it would not be understood.
light when we know more and the race has advanced further into the light. But from the light which streams forth from that larger synthesis, and from the angle of vision of those whose consciousness is higher and greater and more inclusive than the human, the significance of these words may appear totally different. Definition is simply the expression of the immediate understanding of a human mind. But a definition may later be seen to be imperfect and even false, from the angle of a wider knowledge and a more inclusive grasp of words, just as is the case with a so-called fact. Hence all definition, and eventually all facts, will be known to be temporary, all exegesis is but passing in its usefulness. The basic truths of today may be seen later as simply aspects of still greater truth, and when the greater truth is grasped, the significance and the interpretation of its formerly important part is seen to be widely different to what has supposed. This must never be forgotten by any who may read this treatise on the seven rays. An initiate, reading the three words we have been considering, has a very different idea about them than has a disciple or a person who has never thought or studied along these lines, and to whom our vocabulary is novel and strange, conveying little meaning, and is usually quite incorrect. In individualization, the life of God which has been subjected to the processes of growth, stimulation and development in the three lower kingdoms, becomes focused in the fourth kingdom in nature, the human, through the agency of a cycle of crisis, and becomes subjected to the influence of soul energy in one of the seven ray aspects. The quality of the form aspect, as Copyright, copyright 1998 Lucis Trust. 12. A Treatise on the Seven Rays. Volume 2. Esoteric Psychology 2. Embodied in the personality and expressed by the phrase, the ray of the personality becomes subject to the quality of the egoic ray. Those two great influences play upon and affect each other, interacting all the time, producing modifications and changes until, slowly and gradually, the ray of the personality becomes less dominant, and the ray of the soul steadily assumes prominence. Eventually it will be the soul ray that will be expressed, and not the form ray. This personality or form ray then becomes simply the medium of expression through which the quality of the soul can make its presence felt in full power. Something of this idea is conveyed in the ancient occult phrase, the lesser fire must be put out by the greater light. A symbol of this can be seen in the power of the sun apparently to put out a little fire when it can pour its heat right into it. It was earlier pointed out that we can profitably use the words, light, quality, appearance, in lieu of spirit, soul and body, for they express the same truth. The quality of matter, built up into human form and indwelt by the soul or solar angel, is that which normally colors the appearance. Later, this inherent quality of the appearance changes, and it is the quality nature of deity, as expressed in the soul, which obliterates the quality of the forms. During the state we are in it is the quality of matter which is the paramount influence, that material radiance makes itself felt in a triple form. These, from the angle of the entire sweep of the evolutionary process, and as far as the human personality is concerned, appear sequentially, and qualify the matter aspect with its three major presentations. 1. The quality of physical substance. During this stage of development, the man is almost entirely physical.
physical in his reactions and completely under the ray of his physical body. This is the correspondence in man to the Lemurian epoch and to the period of pure infancy. 2. The quality of the astral body. This governs the individual for a very long period, and still governs, more or less, the masses of men. It corresponds to the Atlantean period and to the stage of adolescence. The ray of the astral body is of very great power. 3. The quality of the mental body. This, as far as the race is concerned, is just beginning to wax in power in this Aryan race to which this era belongs. It corresponds to the stage of maturity in the individual. The ray of the mind has a very close relation to the solar angel, and there is a peculiar affiliation between the angel of the presence and the mental man. It is this deep-seated, though oft unrecognized, interplay and cultivated intercourse, which produces the alignment between the soul and its mechanism, man in the three worlds. From the angle of these three ray influences, we have in the life of the aspirant a recapitulation of the triple process which we could call the processes of unfoldment of the Lemurian, Atlantean, and Aryan consciousness. On the path of probation, the ray of the physical body must become subordinated to the potencies emanating from those soul rays which stream forth from the outer tier of petals in the egoic lotus. See a treatise on cosmic fire. These are the copyright copyright 1998 Lucas Trust. 13. A treatise on the seven rays. Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2 Knowledge Petals On the path of discipleship, the astral body is brought into subjection by the ray of the soul as it pours through the second tier of petals, the love petals. Upon the path of initiation, until the third initiation, the ray of the mental body is subdued by the force of the petals of sacrifice, found in the third tier of petals. Thus the three aspects of the personality are brought into subjection by the energy emanating from the nine petals of the egoic lotus. After the third initiation, the whole personality, composed of the three aspects, becomes sensitive to the energy of pure electric fire or light, as it pours through the closed bud at the heart of the egoic lotus. The value of the above information consists in the fact that it gives, symbolically, a synthetic picture of man's unfoldment in higher relations. Its danger consists in the capacity of the human intellect to separate and divide, so that the process is regarded as proceeding in successive stages, whereas in reality there is often a paralleling activity going on, and much overlapping, using and interrelating of aspects, of rays and of processes, within the time cycle. Such is the program for humanity,
stages, limbo, Lemurian consciousness, characterizes the phenomenal man, that fragmentary aspect of the soul which indwells and informs the human form, and which gives to the man any rule or consciousness which may be present, is inert, in so it is unorganized, it is devoid of mind as we understand it, and is distinguished only by a complete identification with the physical form and its activity. This is the period of slow to massive reactions to suffering, joy, pain, to the urge and satisfaction of desire, and to a heavy subconscious urge to betterment. Life after life passes, and slowly the capacity for conscious identification increases, with a growing desire for a larger range of satisfactions, the indwelling and animating soul becomes ever more deeply hidden, the prisoner of the form nature. The entire forces of the life are concentrated in the physical body, and the desires then expressed are physical desires. At the same time there is a growing tendency towards more subtle desires, such as the astral body of Earth. Gradually, the identification of the soul with the form shifts from the physical to the astral form. There is nothing present at this time which could be called a personality. There is simply a living, active physical body, with its wants and desires, its needs and its appetites, accompanied by a very slow yet steadily increasing shift of the consciousness out of the physical into the astral vehicle. When this shift, in course of time, has been successfully achieved, then the consciousness is no longer entirely identified with the physical vehicle, but it becomes centered in the astral emotional. Copyright Copyright 1998 Loses Trust 14. A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2 Body then the focus of the soul's attention, working through the slowly evolving man, is in the world of desire, and the soul becomes identified with another response apparatus, the desire or astral body his consciousness then becomes the Atlantean consciousness. His desires are no longer so vague and inchoate, they have hitherto been concerned with the basic urges or appetites, First, his urge to self-preservation, then to self-perpetuation through the urge to reproduce, and next, to economic satisfaction. At this stage we have the state of awareness of the infant and the raw savage. Gradually, however, we find a steadily growing inner realization of desire itself, and less emphasis upon the physical satisfactions. The consciousness slowly begins to respond to the impact of the mind and to the power to discriminate and choose between various desires. The capacity to employ time somewhat intelligently begins to make a threat in self. The more subtle pleasures begin to make their appeal. Man's desires become less cool and physical. The emerging desire to really begins to appear and a dim sense of aesthetic value. This consciousness is becoming more astral-mental, our common man of it, and the whole trend of his daily attitudes, are his modes of living, and of his character begins to broaden, to unfold, and to improve. Though he is still living by unreasoning desire most of the time, Yet the field of his satisfactions and of his sense urges are less definitely animal and more definitely emotional. Needs and feelings come to be recognized, and a dim desire for peace and the urge to find a nebulous thing called happiness begin to play their part. This corresponds to the period of adolescence and to the state of consciousness called Atlantean. It is the condition of the masses at this present time.
The bulk of human beings are still Atlantean, still purely emotional in their reactions and in their approach to life. They are still governed predominantly by selfish desires and by the calls of the instinctual life. Our Earth humanity is still in the Atlantean stage, whereas the intelligentsia of the world, and the disciples and aspirants, are passing rapidly out of this stage, for they reached individualization on the moon chain, and were the Atlanteans of past history. Workers in the world today should have these facts and sequences most carefully in mind, if they are rightly to appreciate the world problem, and correctly guide and teach the people. They should realize that, speaking generally, there is little true mentality with which to work when dealing with the submerged masses, that they need to be oriented towards the truly desirable, more than towards the truly reasonable, and the right direction of the energy of desire, as it expresses itself in the untutored, easily swayed masses, should be the effort of all who teach. In the more advanced people of the world today, we have the functioning of the mind-body, this is to be found in a large scale in our Western civilization. The energy of the ray of the mental body begins to pour in, and slowly to assert itself. As this happens, the desire nature is brought under control, and consequently the physical nature can become more definitely the instrument of mental impulses. The brain consciousness begins to organize and the focus of energy begins to shift gradually out of the lower centers into the higher. Mankind is developing the Aryan consciousness and is reaching maturity. In the more advanced people of the world, we have also the integration of the personality and the emergence into definite control of the personality ray. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 15. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2.
the life of the soul in this great life cycle is we call humanity. Incarnation passes on the phenomenal plane through all the stages with the same direction, power, steadiness and growth and in the adaptability of form to circumstance and environment, as does the life of God as it flows through the various kingdoms in nature from age to age. The thread of the un unfold Unfolding consciousness can be traced with clarity in all forms are built, used and discarded. Cycles of lives bring the forms into certain phases of unfoldment needed by the progressively inclusive consciousness. Other and later cycles demonstrate the definite and specific effects of this developed consciousness. For some lives are predominantly fruitful in producing causes, which is a paradoxical sentence with deep meaning, and others in working off the effects of the earlier initiated causes. This is a point not often emphasized. Still later cycles of lives bring these two aspects, consciousness and form, into a greater rapport, and thus produce an entirely different type of life. The correspondence to these cycles can be seen working out in the life and consciousness of the planetary logos, as that great life seeks expression through the medium of the four kingdoms in nature. However, and this is the fact of supreme importance, all this activity, all this directed unfoldment, all this evolving purpose and livingness, all the events in all the kingdoms of nature, and all the phases of life conditioning in the human family, plus the kaleidoscope of events, the emergence of characteristics and tendencies, the appearance of forms with their unique coloring, qualities and activities, the synthesis and fusions, the urges, instincts and aspirations, the manifest of loves and hates as expressions of the great law of attraction and repulsion that copyright copyright 1998 loses trust 16 a treatise on the seven rays volume The plan, as it is sensed by the world disciples, in the attempt to work and cooperate with it, is only the sensing of that portion of it which concerns the human consciousness. We have not yet been able to catch even a glimmer of the vastness of the synthetic plan for evolutions other than human, both superhuman and subhuman, nor can we grasp the fabric of God's ideal as it underlies the sum total of the manifested processes, even upon our little planet. All we really know is the fact of the plan, and that it is very good, that we are enfolded within it and subject to it. Herein may be found a cure to the physical problem of free will. It might be said that within the limits of the intelligent direction of the intelligent man there is free will, as far as activity in the human kingdom is concerned. Where no mind activity is present and where there is no power to discriminate, to analyze and to choose, there is no free will. Within the vaster processes of the plan, however, as it includes the entire planetary evolution, there is, for the tiny unit, man, no free will. He is subject, for instance,
sentence to what we call acts of God, and before these he is helpless. He has no choice and no escape. Herein lies a hint upon the working of karma in the human kingdom. Yeah. 
positions thus met with, and frequently misunderstood by the Occidental reader, are, therefore, the result of the futility and inadequacy of language to express the reality then known. After the major initiations are undergone, the state of consciousness of the illumined and liberated adept is such that language serves only to blind and to hinder true understanding. The consciousness of the initiate is of so lofty a nature that it can only be described in terms of release, of negation, and through the emphasis of that which it is not. It is a state of no-thing and non-ego, for all ego of awareness is superseded by a state of being and of consciousness which is only capable of comprehension and expression when form life is of no further use to the perfected spiritual life. It is a state of non-individuality, yet with the subconscious knowledge and gains of the individual experience. The center of consciousness is so far removed from any individual separate identity that that particular factor has faded entirely out, and only the macrocosmic life is sentiently realized. It is a state of non-activity from our present angle of vision, because all individual reactions to the activity of matter or to that state of being which we call egoic, have dropped away, and life and mind can no longer be swept into motion by any of the factors which have hitherto produced what we have called soul activity and form existence. Nevertheless, though the consciousness is other than all that has been hitherto known, and though it can only be expressed in terms of negation, the truth must be born constantly in mind that the greater awareness must always include the lesser awarenesses. Consequently all possible actions and reactions, identifications and focus things, awarenesses and contacts, ray impulses, approaches and withdrawals, and all possible expressions of the divine activity and qualities, phenomenal and non-phenomenal, are included in the state of being which is now the natural state of the liberated and enlightened spiritual existence. All are possible of recovery through the will or in response to a need, but the spiritual being is no longer held by them or identified with them. Copyright Copyright 1998 Uses Trust 18. A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2 Each of the stages on the great path of liberation or enlightenment with which we have been concerned, individualization, initiation and identification, have led the life or the spiritual, interior man, from point to point, from quality to quality, from realization to realization, from phenomenal appearance to spiritual living, from physical awareness to sentient, emotional awareness, and from that to mental differentiation and separateness. He has been carried from hell to heaven, from heaven to nirvana, from the life conditioning of the personal ego to that of the group soul, and thence to that of the liberated state of pure intuitional life. He has passed from form experience as a whole to that complete freedom from all vibratory impressions which it is the nature of pure being divorced from phenomenal existence to demonstrate. But at the same time, nothing is lost of capacity, or quality or of sentient awareness. This is beautifully expressed for us in the words of the old commentary, found in the archives of the Masters. The quality of life fades out. It's bigger than is gone. Yet the blessed ones reveal a greater quality. The color still remains. The nature of life in form fails so here. It flashes forth a little while, then disappears. The blessed ones, at will, can take a form, yet are not then the form. The seven great rays sleep into manifested life. 
that the Blessed Ones at any time can sweep forth into manifested light. They carry then the potencies of spirit to meet the need expressed. Light holds them not, their purpose is not imprisoned, their will is not subdued. They appear and disappear at will. An expression of the truth of this can be seen demonstrating in the world each full moon of May, when the Buddha flashes forth into manifestation, for the fulfillment of the plan and at the urgent behest of his own spiritual will. Not holds the Blessed Ones. Neither the deities nor form, neither desire nor mind, nor any quality of life. Pure life they are. Pure being and pure will, pure love and pure intent, this is all that unenlightened man can grasp, and only that in part. The blessed ones are not, and yet they are. The blessed ones know not, and yet know all. The blessed ones love not, yet offer love divine. The blessed ones remember not, yet all is recollection. The Blessed Ones remain in isolation here, and yet it will can take a form. The Blessed Ones dwell ever in the high and lofty place, yet oft can walk on earth in light phenomenal. The Blessed Ones manifest not through form, yet are all forms and all intents. Then the old commentary runs through what would constitute many pages of writing, showing. Copyright, copyright 1998, Moses Trust. 19. A treatise on the seven rays. Volume 2. Esoteric Psychology 2. That the Blessed Ones are not and yet are all there is. That they possess nothing and yet are in themselves the expression of all reality. That they dwell nowhere and yet are found everywhere. That they have faded out and yet are shining in full radiance and can be seen. Negation after negation is piled up, only promptly to be contradicted in an effort to show how divorced from, and yet inclusive of, form is the life of the Blessed Ones. It ends with a wonderful injunction. Therefore be full of joy, O pilgrim on the way towards enlightened being, for gain and loss are one. Darkness and light is must finally lead us to a condition of such complete aloneness that the horror of the great blackness will settle down upon us. But when that pall of blackness is lifted and the light again pours in, the disciple sees that all that was grasped and treasured, and then lost and removed, has been restored, but with this difference, that it no longer holds the life imprisoned by desire. We are treading the way that leads to the mountain top of isolation, and will find it full of terror. Upon that mountain top we must fight the final battle with the dweller on the threshold, only to find that that too is an illusion. That high point of isolation and the battle itself are only illusions and figments of unreality. They are the last stronghold of the ancient glamour, and of the great heresy of separateness. 
Then we, the beatific ones, will eventually find ourselves merged with all that is, in love and understanding. The isolation, a necessary stage, is itself but an illusion. We are treading the way of purification and step by step all that we cherish is removed, lust for form life, desire for love, and the great glamour of hatred. These disappear and we stand purified and empty. The distress of emptiness is the immediate result. It grips us and we feel that the price of holiness is too high. But, standing on the way, suddenly the whole being is flooded with light and love, and the emptiness is seen as constituting that through which light and love may flow to a needy world. The purified one can dwell then in that place where dwell the blessed lords, and from that place go forth to illumine the world of men and of the deities. There are four ways which stretch before the disciples of the Lord of the world. They must all be trodden before the inner being is released, and the liberated Son of God can enter, at will, what are symbolically called, the four gates into the city of Shambhala, that city of the Most High God, which is ever swept by the life of those who have achieved liberation through loneliness, detachment, isolated unity, and purification. A realization of the goal and the way to Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 20 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2 Esoteric Psychology 2 That goal is of service at this time, and it is to this realization that the teachers of humanity seek to stimulate the sons of God. According to the ray type of quality, so if you the reaction of the life to the great stages of individualization, initiation, and identification. This is a major occult platitude, but it is one that is much in need of consideration and reflection. Let us bear in mind always that we are considering qualities which govern appearances and express the life. What is called in the Eastern literature, the Blessed One, refers to one who is perfectly expressing some ray quality through some chosen phenomenal appearance, which is assumed a will for purpose of service, but which in no way constitutes a limitation and in no way holds the Blessed One a prisoner, because his consciousness is in no way identified with the phenomenal appearance, nor with the quality it expresses. A. I N D I V I D U A L I S A T I O N and the seven ray types. We will express the reaction of these seven ray types to the process of individualization, which is the process of identification with form by seven occult statements which can, if properly understood, is the keynote of the new psychology. They state the major impulse, the native quality, and the technique of unfoldment. Ray 1. The Blessed One flies like an arrow into matter. He destroys or ruptures the way by which he might return. He grounds himself deeply in the depths of form. He asserts, I will return. My power is great. I will destroy all obstacles. Nothing can stop my progress to my goal. Around me lies the which I have destroyed. What must I do? The answer comes. Order from chaos. O pilgrim on the way of death. This is the way for you. Love you must learn. Dynamic will you have. The right use of destruction for the furtherance of the plan, must be the way for you. Adherence to the rhythm of the planet will release the hidden Blessed One and order bring. Ray 2. The Blessed One built him an ark. Stage by stage he built it, and floated upon the bosom of the waters. 
Deeply he hid himself, and his light was no more seen, only his floating ark. His voice was heard. El have built and strongly built, but am a prisoner within my building. My light is hidden, only my word goes forth. Around me lie the waters. Can I return from whence I? Copyright Copyright 1998 Versus Trust 21 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2 Esoteric Psychology 2 Came Is the word strong enough to open wide the door? What shall I do? The answer came Build now an art translucent Which can reveal the light O builder of the art and by that light you shall reveal the lighted way. The power to build anew, the right use of the word, and the using of the light, these will release the blessed one, deep hidden in the ark. Grade 3. The blessed one is the That 
Angel 2 must disappear. The Blessed One remains and passes through that door into the Light Sublime. Ray 6. The Blessed One caught the vision of the Way, and followed the Way without discretion. Fury characterized his efforts. The Way led down into the world of real life. Between the pairs of opposites, he took his stand, and as he swung pendant between them, fleeting glimpses of the gold shone forth. He swung in mid-heaven. He sought to swing into that radiant place of light, where stood the door upon the higher way. Whatever he swung between the pairs of opposites, he spoke at last within himself. I cannot seem to find the way. I try this way, and tread with force that way, and always with the keenest wish. I try always. What shall I do to find the way? A cry went forth. It seemed to come from deep within his heart. Tread thou, O pilgrim on the way of sensuous light, the middle, lighted way. It passes straight between the dual worlds. Find thou that narrow, middle way. It leads you to your goal. Seek that perceptive steadiness which leads to proved endurance. Adherence to the chosen way, and ignoring of the pairs of opposites, will bring this blessed one upon the lighted way into the joy of proved success. Ray 7 the Blessed One sought the pathway into forms but held with firmness to the hand of the Magician. He sought to reconcile the Pilgrim, who was himself, to life in form. He sought to bring the world of disorder in which he found himself into some kind of order. He wandered far into the deepest depths and became immersed in chaos and disorder. He could not understand. Copyright Copyright 1998 Book Trust 23 A Treatise on the Seven Ways Volume 2 Esoteric Psychology 2 Ray Philadelphia Hand of the Magician He sought to bring about that order that was so afraid. He talked with all he met, with his bewilderment increased. To the Magician thus he spoke. The ways of the Creator must be good. Behind all that which seems to be, must be a plan. Teach me the purpose of it all. How can I work, immersed in deepest matter? Tell me the thing that I must do. The Magician said, Listen, O worker in the furthest world, to the rhythm of the times. Note the pulsation in the heart of that which is divine. Retire into the silence and attune yourself unto the whole. Then venture forth. Establish the right rhythm. Bring order to the forms of life which must express the plan of deity. For this blessed one release is found in York. He must display his knowledge of the plan by the sounding of those words which will evoke the builders of the forms and thus create the new. It might be of value, if here were summarized in more simple and less occult terms, the significance of the above esoteric stanzas, to express their true meaning in a few succinct and terse phrases. The stanzas are of no use unless they convey to the ray types among the students of this treatise some useful meaning, whereby they can live more truly. The individualized spirit expresses itself through the various ray types in the following manner. Ray 1. Dynamic one-pointedness. Destructive energy. Power realized selfishly. Lovelessness. Isolation, a longing for power and authority, desire to dominate, expressed strength and self-will, leading to a dynamic use of energy for the furtherance of the plan. The use of destructive forces in order to prepare the way for the builders. The will to power in order to cooperate. 
power realized as the major weapon of love. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 24 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2 Esoteric Psychology 2 Identification with the Rhythm of the Whole The Cessation of Isolation Ray 2 The Power to Build for Selfish Ends Capacity to Sense the Whole and to Remain Apart the cultivation of a separated spirit. The hidden light. The realization of selfish desire. Longing for material well-being. Selfishness, and subordination of all soul powers to this end. Leading to. Building wisely, in relation to the plan. Inclusiveness. A longing for wisdom and truth. Sensitivity to the whole. Renunciation of the great heresy of separativeness. The revelation of the light. True illumination. Right speech through generated wisdom. Ray free. Force manipulation through selfish desire. Intelligent use of force with wrong motive. Intense material and mental activity. The realization of energy is an end in itself. Longing for glory, beauty and for material objectives. Submergence in illusion, glamour, and maya. Leading to the manipulation of energy in order to reveal beauty and truth. The use of forces intelligently for the furtherance of the plan. Ordered rhythmic activity in cooperation with the whole. Desire for right revelation of divinity and light. Adherence to right action. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust. 25. A Treatise on the Seven Rays. Volume 2. Esoteric Psychology 2. The Revelation of Glory and Goodwill. Ray 4. Confused Combat. The realization of that which is high and that which is low. The darkness which precedes form expression. The veiling of the intuition. The sensing of inharmony and cooperation with the part and not the whole. Identification with humanity, the fourth creative hierarchy. Undue recognition of that which is produced by speech. Abnormal sensitivity to that which is the not-self. Constant points of crisis. Leading to. Unity and harmony. The evocation of the intuition. Right judgment and pure reason. The wisdom which works through the angel of the presence. I could here point out a constant misconception on the part of esotericists. This fourth ray of harmony, beauty and art is not the ray, per se, of the creative artist. The creative artist is found equally on all rays, without exception. This ray is the ray of the intuition and of the harmonizing of all that has been achieved through the activity of form life, as later synthesized and absorbed by the solar angel, it manifests eventually as all that can be evoked and evolved through the power of the one life the monad working through form expression. It is the point of meaning for all the energies flowing through the higher spiritual triad and the lower triplicity. Ray 5. The energy of ignorance. Criticism. The power to rationalize and destroy. Mental separation. Desire for knowledge. This leads to material activity. Detailed analysis. Intense materialism and temporarily the negation of deity. Intensification of the power to isolate. The implications of wrong emphasis. Distorted views of truth. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust. 26. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, 
Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2. Mental Devotion to Form and Form Activity. Theology, Leading to a Knowledge of Reality. The Realization of the Soul and its Potentiality. Power to Recognize and Contact the Angel of the Presence. Sensitivity to Deity, to Light and to Wisdom. Spiritual and Mental Devotion. The Power to Take Initiation. This is a point of real importance. Grade 6. Violence. Fanaticism. Willful adherence to an ideal. Short-sighted blindness. Militarism and a tendency to make trouble with others and with groups. The power to see no point except one's own. Suspicion of people's motives. Rapid reaction to glamour and illusion. Emotional devotion and bewildered idealism. Vibratory activity between the pairs of opposites. Intense capacity to be personal and emphasize personalities. Leading to directive, inclusive idealism. Steadiness of perception through the expansion of consciousness. Reaction to, and sympathy with, the point of view of others. Willingness to see the work of other people progress along their chosen lines. The choosing of the middle way. Peace and not war. The good of the whole and not the part. Grace 7. Black magic, for the use of magical powers for selfish ends. The power to sit upon the fence, till the selfish values emerge. Disorder and chaos. True misunderstanding of the plan. The wrong use of speech to bring about chosen objectives. Untrue. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust. 27. A Treatise on the Seven Rays. Volume 2. Esoteric Psychology 2. Sex Magic. The Selfish Perversion of Soul Powers. Leading to. White magic, the use of soul powers for spiritual ends. The identification of oneself with reality. Right order through right magic. The power to cooperate with the whole. Understanding of the plan. The magical work of interpretation. Manifestation of divinity. A close study of the above suggested phrases. Showing as they do the wrong and the right major expressions of great force will lead the student correctly to comprehend his own great nature and also whereabouts he stands in his development. One of the major faults of disciples today is the pain of too close attention to the faults, errors and activities of other disciples, and too little attention to their own fulfillment of the law of Io their own dharma and work. A second failing of disciples, and particularly of the working and accepted disciples in the world at this present time, is incorrect speech conveying ambiguous meanings and motivated by criticism, or by an individual desire to shine. In olden days, the neophyte was forced into a prolonged silence.
It needs time in which to reflect, and the opportunity to sense the universal rhythm. Modern disciples, if they are to do their work as desired and to cooperate with the plan correctly, need that inner reflective quiet which in no way negates intense outer activity that which does release them from worthy criticism, feverish discussion, and constant preoccupation with the dharma, the motives and the methods of their fellow disciples. P. The rays and initiation. It will not be possible for me to make clear the real reactions to the final process which we have considered briefly, namely the stage in the liberation of the spirit which we call identification. All that is possible, even in the case of initiation, is to give the elementary standards which convey to accepted disciples some of the significance of the first initiation. As regards identification, the reactions of the illumined initiate are made available to his intelligence in symbolic form if it is. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 28. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2. These forms were described, they would be completely misunderstood. When the third initiation takes place and the wider open door looms before the initiate, he will then discover the meaning of that type of realization which is here called, for lack of a better name, identification. Ray 1. The angel of the present stands within the light divine, the center and the meeting place of many forces. These forces meet and blend. They focus in the head of him who stands before the angel. Eye to eye, and face to face, and hand to hand, they stand. Will reinforces will, and love meets love. The will to power merges with the will to love and strength with wisdom meets. These two are one. From that high spot of unity, the one who is released stands forth and says, I return from whence I came, from the formless to the world of form I make my way. I will to be, I will to work, I will to serve and save, I will to live the race. I serve the plan with will, the whole with power. Ray 2. The angel of the presence draws the wanderer to him. Love divine attracts the seeker on the way. The point of merging is achieved. Mouth to mouth, the breath is drawn forth, and the breath is drawn in. Heart to heart, the beating of these twain is merged in one. Foot to foot, the strength is passed from the greater to the less, and thus the way is trodden. Force inspires the word, the breath. Love inspires the heart, the light. Activity controls the treading of the way. These three produce the merging. All then is lost in gain. The word goes forth. I tread the way of love. I love the plan. Unto that plan, I surrender all I have. Unto the whole, I give my heart's deep love. I serve the plan. I serve the whole with love and understanding. Ray 3. The angel of the present stands within the center of the room forces. For ages long, thus has he stood, the center of all energies from above and from below. With intelligence, the angel works to make the one who is above and the one who is below the blend and be as one. With twelve clear notes, the hour sounds full.
plan proceeds upon the outer way, it shows itself. The whole will stand revealed. That plan I know, I will, with love and... Copyright Copyright 1998 Rules of Trust 29 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2 Esoteric Psychology 2 Mind To serve that plan Ray 4 The Angel of the Present stands in his beauty rare upon the light of way. The glow of the presence pours throughout the field of combat and ends, in peace, the strife. The warrior stands revealed, his work is done. Back to back, the angel and the warrior stand, their auras meeting in the radiant sphere of light. The 201. The ghost goes forth. Harmony is restored and the beauty of the Lord of Love shines forth. Such is the plan, thus is the whole revealed. The higher and the lower meet, form in the formless merge and blend, and know themselves as one. In harmony with all united souls, I serve the plan. Ray 5 The angel of the present serves the three, the one above, the one below, and the one whoever is. This refers to the fact that on the fifth plane the angel is definitely met and known, and the three aspects of the higher triad, Ruddy, the abstract mind and spirit, plus the ego in the causal body, and the lower mind are here blended and fused. The great triangle begins its revolution, and its rays reach out in all directions, and permeate the whole. The man and angel face each other, and know themselves to be the same. The light that radiates from the heart, the throat, and from the center which stands midway meet and merge. The 201. The voice that speaks within the silence can be heard. The power that reaches from the highest point has reached the lowest. The plan can now be known. The whole can stand revealed. The love that stretches from the heart, the life that issues forth from God, have served the plan. The mind that gathers all with wisdom into the boundaries of the plan has reached the outer limits of the sphere of God's activity. That power informs my life. That love inspires my heart. That mind enlightens all my world. I therefore serve the plan. Ray 6 The angel of the presence reaches down, and, at the midway point, pierces the fog and glamour. The path stands clear. The one who treads the path and stops to fight, who wrestles blindly with the two who seek to hinder and to blind, sees the way free. It stands revealed. He ceases from the clamor and the fight. He finds his way into the present. Knee to knee, and foot to foot, they stand. Hand to hand, and breast to breast, forehead to forehead, see them stand. And thus they merge and blend. Copyright, copyright, 
Then follows a phrase which is incapable of translation into modern language. It signifies that complete merging which the mystic endeavors to express in terms of the marriage in the heavens, and which has been wrongly twisted into the false teaching and sex magic. This phrase, expressed by a painted symbol, symbolizes complete unity between the outer and the inner, the objective and the subjective, between spirit and matter, and between the physical and the essential. The two are one, not more remains to grasp. The word is manifest, the work is seen complete. The whole is vision, the magic work is wrought. Again the two are one, the plan is served, no word need then be said. These phrases are an attempt to express some of the realizations of the true initiate when he stands, at the third initiation, before the angel and sees that angel also pass away, so that not is left but conscious knowledge and realization. Although this statement may signify but little to us at present, it will, nevertheless, serve to demonstrate the futility of dealing with the secrets of the mysteries and with initiation through the medium of words. When this is better realized, the true work of the Masonic dramas will begin to measure up to the need. This section expresses some of the basic emerging truths which will carry meaning to the senior disciples and the initiates of the world, who are battling, at this time, in the service of the clan. They are present in the world at this time, and their work is bearing fruit, but they need at times the incentive of the future achievable glory to aid them to carry on. This treatise is, therefore, somewhat abstruse and quite symbolical. It may appear difficult to comprehend, and it may mean little to some and nothing at all to others. If the disciples of the world are truly struggling and if they are applying practically the teaching given, as far as in them lies, they will find as time elapses, and their reason and intuition awaken, that such symbolic and abstract statements become clearer and clearer, serving to convey the intended teaching. When this happens, the angel of the presence approaches ever closer, and lights the disciple on his way. The sense of separateness diminishes until, at last, light permeates the darkness, and the angel dominates the light. 2. The Two Cycles of Egoic Appropriation Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 31. A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 2, Esoteric Psychology 2 We shall now enter upon a somewhat technical consideration of the relation of the ego and its ray to the sheets or vehicles through which it must express itself, and through which it must enter into contact with certain phases of divine experience. The foundation of what is here elaborated in relation to the cycles of appropriation will be found briefly touched upon in a treatise on cosmic fire, pages 787 to 790, and the following statements, gathered from those pages, will be elucidated in the preceding pages. 1. As the ego or soul appropriates to itself a sheet for expression and experience, points of crisis will inevitably occur. A. The work of passing on to a particular plane for purposes of incarnation is one such point. This concerns the passing down to a lower plane, or from a lower plane onto a higher. Indications of the importance and the crucial nature of such transition can be seen in certain formulas which are used when passing from one degree in masonry to another, as in raising a lodge from a lower to a higher degree. B. Another such point of crisis occurs when the mental body is swept into activity and the etheric body is subtly 
ego talus. 2. Relationship between the ego or soul and the dense physical body is established when A. Matter of the three lowest subplanes of the physical plane is built into the etheric body, prior to physical incarnation, and the potential channels of communication and of exit are established. These are the main channel or line of communication found between the center at the base of the spine and that in the head, via the spleen. B. A corresponding activity takes place in the process of liberation upon the path of return in which the bridge, or the antasparana, is established between the lower mental body, the causal body, and the higher mental worlds. When the work under the first category is accomplished upon the physical plane and its technique is understood, man can then achieve a state from the physical body in full, waking continuity of consciousness. When a similar work has taken place on the higher plane and the bridge is satisfactorily built, then the initiate can escape from the limitations of form life and enter into that state of consciousness called nirvana by the Buddhist. This high state of being has to be entered also in full continuity of consciousness. physical incarnation and one producing the liberation of the soul from that condition, are, and must always be, the result of group vibration, of group impulse, group incentive and group impetus. One impetus originates in the group of souls, of which in
Atlantean civilization, the appropriation of the astral body. 3. In the present Aryan world, the appropriation of the mental body, with consequent intellectual unfoldment. 4. In the coming race, conscious appropriation and integration of the threefold personality. 5. In the final race, the expression, in fullest measure, of the soul and its vehicles, plus some. Copyright Copyright 1998 Loses Trust. 33. A Treatise on the Seven Rays. Volume 2. Esoteric Psychology 2. Measure of Spiritual Manifestation. Here, therefore, we have five points of crisis in the life of the individual, in conjunction with the whole, with the first stage called individualization, in Lemuria, the fourth stage in our race, and the final stage at the end of the age. These stages are carried forward over so long a period of time, and are so closely interrelated, that one stage and period makes possible that of another, and only the analytical mind sees or seeks differentiation. The reflection of this fivefold experience in any individual life takes place in the following order in the life of the average intelligent aspirant, who responds to, and takes advantage of the civilization and education of the present time. 1. Appropriation of the physical sheath. This takes place between the fourth and seventh year, when the soul, hitherto overshadowing, takes possession of the physical vehicle. 2. A crisis during adolescence, wherein the soul appropriates the astral vehicle. This crisis is not recognized by the general public and is only dimly sensed, from its evidenced temporary abnormalities, by the average psychologist. They do not recognize the cause but only the effects. 3. A similar crisis between the 21st and 25th years, wherein the mind vehicle is appropriated. The man should then begin to respond to egoic influences, and in the case of the advanced man, he frequently does. 4. A crisis between the 35th and 42nd years, wherein conscious contact with the soul is established, the threefold personality then begins to respond, as a unit, to soul impulse. 5. For the remaining years of life, there should be an increasingly strong relationship between the soul and its vehicles, leading to another crisis between